Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the fourth panel of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy's January 2021 conference, our second effort at a virtual event, and we do miss the physical one, but it's what we've got dealt to us as, as, as all of you. I thank you very much for uh, attending. Uh, panelists, I thank you for being here, and we are going to be talking about the unsung hero of Cuban policy and Cuban policy discussion, um, but probably among one of the most important sectors uh, in dealing with uh, issues of Cuba, not just within Cuba, but Cuba within uh, the, uh, the flows of trade. Uh, and that is the agricultural sector. And I wanna thank, we've got a stellar group of, uh, of participants with a very interesting set of, um, of, uh, of uh, of papers that, that they will be presenting. And you've heard more than enough from me. Um, I'm Larry Backer and I helped uh, put this thing together. Um, but uh, let's, let's get to the real stars of, of this panel. What I will do is introduce each in turn. They will have 20 minutes. For those of you who are listening to the, the, um, the presentations, if you uh, have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. We will attempt to answer them uh, after the presentations. Each presenter will have about 20 minutes and then hopefully that will leave us about an hour for what I hope will be a really interesting and intense set of discussions. Uh, and without further ado, it is my extreme great pleasure to introduce uh, Mario Gonzalez Corso and Armando Nova. Armando will not be able to be here with us. He's in uh, Cuba at the moment, but I will introduce them both to you. Uh, and they will be speaking about El Desarrollo de la Producción Agro... Uh, I can't even read. Agropecuaria en Cuba. I, I've been at this too long. Um, and we are going to be talking about the uh, Plan de Soberanía Alimentaria y Nutricional. So it's, it's going to be, a, a, and, and I don't know, is uh, the talk going to be in English or Spanish? It will Sorry. be in English, English. In English. Um, Mario is a professor of economics at the Department of Economics and Business at Lehman College at the City University of New York, where he teaches graduate and undergraduate uh, courses in economics and finance. He's also a faculty fellow at the Cuba Project of the Bildner Center for Western Hemispheric Studies at the Graduate Center at CUNY and contributing editor for, editor for the section on the Cuban economy of the Handbook of Latin American Studies published by the Library of Congress. I bow to you, that's a great effort. Um, his research and publications include financial sector employment trends and recent developments entrepreneurship uh, with a focus on transition or post-socialist economies and economic reforms and transition economies with a particular emphasis on Cuban agriculture, banking, and the emerging non-state sector. Armando Nova Gonzalez uh, received his doctorate in economics at the University of Havana, where he serves as professor and investigador titular. He has served as part of the Equipo de, de Investigaciones Económicas Agrícolas of the Economics Faculty of the University of Havana, helped organize the Equipo Tecnico Agricola and was heavily involved in citrus industry efforts back when there was a lot of citrus. Uh, he's given courses, lectures, and seminars all over the world and in the U.S., including at Florida State University, Stanford, and the University of California at Berkeley. He's the author of three books, um, one of them, Aspectos Económicos de las Cítricos en Cuba, uh, la, agricu la Agricultura en Cuba, Evolución y Trayectoria, 1959 to 2005. I'm doing English and Spanish, sorry about that. Um, which was a winner of the University of Havana Prize for Best Book on Economics in 2006. And El Modelo Agrícola Cubano y los Lineamientos de la Política, Economía y Social, which won the University of Havana Prize for Distinguished Book Publications in 2015. His new book, El Cooperativismo en la Economía Cubana is forthcoming. He's the author of more than 12, a co-author of more than 12 books, and a member of an author collective that received a national award from the Science Academy of Cuba for their book on Cuban economic restructuring. His work has received a number of other awards. We can go on and on and on. Um, and he is a member of the board of consultants for the journal PEMAS and sits on a number of agricultural boards. Um, and with that, 
it's all yours. Thank you, Larry. Um, I like to first of all uh, thank everyone for who's joining us for uh, joining um, and this uh, this panel. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, but I also want to thank uh, the president of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy, Gary Maybarduk, for uh, helping, uh, you know, spearleading organizing this conference, the members of the board, uh, some of which are present in this panel. It's a pleasure to be in this panel with um, Juan Tomas uh, Sanchez, who is uh, very well known to the association, who has a, a, a very ample expertise in the agricultural sector. It's also a pleasure to have uh, Bill Messina, uh, from the University of Florida participating in our panel. I look forward to their presentations, but I also want to welcome a new presenter, uh, Joan, a uh, professor from the University of Miami, um, and who will be joining us uh, also presenting in this panel. It's the first time that uh, that he uh, presents at ASCII, so I'd like to welcome him uh, to, to our panel as well. Um, I'm going to uh, begin uh, this presentation. I hope you can hear me well. You can see the slides uh, that we prepared. I'm really also honored to be co-presenting this paper with Armando Nova Gonzalez. I know his uh, very lengthy biography was just summarized by uh, Professor Kata Becker, uh, but Armando, it's uh, well known to, to all of us here in ASCII, particularly those of us who study Cuban agriculture, uh, for his contributions to the research and publications on Cuba's agricultural sector. I want to move on and here's a very short outline of our paper. So I'm going to talk about very briefly to present some general facts about Cuban agriculture. Uh, that will be followed with a overview of the reforms that were implemented in Cuba uh, since 2007. These are of course the agricultural reforms then just to, to give us a sense of background um, related to the title of our paper, right? Uh, as you know, the title of our paper is the Food and Nutritional Sovereignty Program and the Development of Agricultural Production. But to provide background, we want to also talk about uh, topic number three here, which is basically a very brief overview of some selected indicators of agricultural performance after 2007. And then, of course, we'll uh, discuss the food and nutritional sovereignty pro, uh, plan, uh, the concept and definition as Cuba sees it, and what are the main components of the plan. And then our final topic will be, or the final topic that I'll present here in this very short time that we have will be the future prospects for Cuban agriculture uh, based on what we know thus far about the food and nutritional sovereignty plan. Uh, plan. So Cuban agricultural sector, you know, uh, a couple of facts about it, the total uh, land surface, we're talking about only 11, uh, around 11 million hectares of agricultural land uh, in Cuba. Um, of that, about 55% is held by the state sector and about 45% is held by the non-state sector. But when we look at the, what really matters, right, which is not just the, the total surface, but the agricultural surface and the cultivated land. As you can see here on this first table, the non-state sector in terms of the agricultural sector holds 68.5%. Um, in terms of the cultivated surface, which is around 3.1 million hectares, 65% mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. is currently held by the non-state sector. Um, just to highlight a little bit here, if you look at the distribution of land at the present time, in terms of the cultivated land, we have within the non-state sector, we have uh, the credit and service co-ops co and private farming farmers, I should say, holding around 33% of that land. So, so just to summarize that about one third of the cultivated land is held by the more autonomous, you know, in relative terms, uh, you know, credit and service co-ops and private farmers. And then finally, at the bottom of this table, you can see the amount of idle land. It's around 395,000 hectares. 
that represents around 6% of the agricultural surface. We also show data here just to give you a sense of what, you know, what, what is the structure of Cuba's um, agricultural sector in terms of the productive units. Well, when we say that, there are really three kinds of general productive units. There are state enterprises, there are agricultural cooperatives, and, and of course, uh, use of fruit farmers and private farmers. But the center, the epicenter of Cuban agriculture in terms of the productive units are the co-ops. And you can see here that at the close of 2019, there were 3,700 um, co-ops altogether. And the credit and service cooperatives were around 35, 36%, 40%. Uh, the UBPCs represented 40%. Um, in, you know, in, in our paper, we actually provide more information about the definitions and the specific features of the UBPCs, the CPAs, and the CCSs. So very briefly, these are different, the, the three principal kinds of agricultural co-ops that operate currently in Cuba. So, so the number has gone down a bit from, you know, if we compare that to uh, 2010, 2008, and so on. But here you can see the composition of the, uh, of the breakdown of the cooperatives that are engaged in agricultural production. Then very briefly, just to give everyone a background in terms of employment and wages in agriculture, well, what we present here is total employment and uh, agricultural employment. If you look at total employment in Cuba, this is for all sectors of the economy, around 4.5 million people, 792,400 were employed in agriculture. So agriculture employment represents around 17.3% of total employment. That number, as I'll show you in, in, in another part of the presentation, that number has declined a little bit, but it, it, it used to be 18.5% back in 2010. Uh, it's now down to 17.3%. Agricultural workers uh, employed by co-ops represent around 10% of the total labor force, of, of total, not the total labor force, but total employment. Um, but an interesting finding is this number in the bottom here. I was trying to see if I can have a pointer, but I don't, I don't have access to a pointer here. But um, the agricultural employment in agricultural co-ops as a percentage of agricultural employment, it's around 58%. If we go back, as we do in our paper, and we present that data for 2010, the percentage was about half of this, and we discuss why these numbers changed the way that they did. Finally, at the bottom of this table, because I really want to get to our uh, to the plan, right? At the bottom of this table, we summarize the monthly wages on average nationwide for all sectors at the end of 2019, 879 Cuban pesos at the, uh, the all sectors. But as you can see at the bottom of this page, number three, in agriculture, the average wage, monthly wage was 887 Cuban pesos. So that differential has declined. It used to be much wider at the beginning of the reforms. So that, that's, we find that to be also an interesting finding. Um, we also discuss uh, all the reforms that were implemented in Cuba, all the agricultural reforms that have been implemented in Cuba since 2007. We provide a list here in the interest of time. I'm just going to mention the fact that, and I think it's well known um, by uh, those of us who study agriculture and, and in general, people who study the Cuban economy, that the most significant reform thus far in terms of agriculture has been the expansion of usufruit farming that began by back in 2008 with Decree Law 259 and Decree Law 282. Then in 2012, we have a further expansion of usufruit farming by the approval of Decree Law 300, Decree Law 311 in 2014, and then uh, Law Number 319 back in 2014. So 2008, uh, and then 2012, four years later, and then 2014, six years later from, you know, from the initial reforms, we have an expansion of use of fruit farming. And then more recently in 2018, there was the approval of decree laws 350 and 358, which further expanded the terms of use of fruit farming. We really get into this in our paper, but again, the theme of our paper is not so much the reforms, but the uh, food and nutritional uh, program that Cuba has recently announced. 
So, but we discussed the reforms as, as a way to provide context to what's happened in Cuban agriculture since 2007. Speaking of that, you can see here, one of the effects of the reform has been the redistribution of land or changes, let me say it differently, changes in the distribution of land in terms of tenure, not ownership, but tenure. And, and that's a very clear distinction that we need to make here. I know you've seen a lot of data here in table number one. I just wanna emphasize three, perhaps three or four principal points and, and then we'll make the slides available so anyone who's interested can look at the data and you know, we'll, we'll be happy to take any questions after uh, during the Q&A session or after the conference even. But the first trend is a, an increase in the amount of land held by the non-state sector. And I think that's, that's a very common theme when we look at Q in agriculture, uh, the land distribution since 2007. A, a second theme though, is that within the non-state sector, if you look at the data carefully, um, and we discussed this at length in our paper, if you look at the data carefully, you'll notice that there's been a redistribution of land within the non-state sector. So more land, it's now being held by the more autonomous uh, credit and service cooperatives by private farmers, by use of fruit farmers uh, in 2019 in comparison to, 20, uh, to 2007, or it, it, we can go back to 2009, 2010, and you'll see the same trends. So what that means is that at the present time, you have a higher percentage of the agricultural surface, the cultivated surface in the hand, in the hands of the more autonomous productive units. Now, of course, that would mean, right, that would imply that if you have that, and we assume that credit and service cooperatives and private farmers are more efficient in terms of allocating their inputs to generate output than the UBPCs and the CPAs, that would mean that you would see um, increases in agricultural production. And I'll show you very soon that that's in fact the case. In some areas of agricultural production, total output has increased, but by no means that's enough to satisfy the demands of the Cuban population. So there has been a change in land distribution. Employment, take a look at employment. So total employment has declined in Cuba from 2010 to 2019. Those were the two comparison points that we chose uh, by 8% look at the decline in agricultural employment. In fact, agricultural sector employment has almost declined by twice as much, not quite twice as much, but pretty close to twice as much. So 14% decline in agricultural employment. But you look at employment in agricultural cooperatives and look at the increase in that 111%, which really merits some discussion which again, that we, we cover that in our paper, uh, but here in the interest of time, I'm not going to get too much into the accounting reasons behind that change in agricultural uh, cooperative employment. But the bottom line remains, demographic factors, economic factors are changing the employment trends in Cuban agriculture. So there's a migration of labor away from the agricultural sector to other, sec to other sectors of the economy. There's a migration of labor in general away from Cuba, young people leaving Cuba, uh, traveling you know, and, and, and moving overseas and so on. So the other key point that I wanna stress here is if you look at the bottom of this table number two, you'll see the uh, percentage uh, agricultural employment as a percentage of total employment remains pretty much the same. It used to be 18.5% back in 2010. It is now around 17% in 2019. And again, the, another uh, key finding here is uh, around 35% of all the uh, people employed in, in agriculture are usufruct farmers. So around a little bit more than a third of total agricultural workers are working, are, are employed uh, as usufruct farmers. So that's another trend that we saw. And then output. If you look at here in table three, we have output data for non-sugar crop uh, crops. And what we did is we took the, the leading categories of non-sugar crops and we compare that uh, their production levels back in 2008 and 2019. Uh, and you'll notice that there, it's really a mixed bag. You, you'll notice that in four of these categories, you see them in red, 
actually agricultural production has declined as a percentage in terms of percentage, right? Uh, so vegetables, um, cereals, um, citrus fruits and other fruits and so on, agricultural production has declined in those, in those uh, categories. In other categories, production has increased, but again, we are, uh, it's, it's well known. So it's a well known fact that even though production has increased in some of those categories, um, it's not enough. Cuba does not produce enough food to feed its people. And so that brings us to the agricultural trade Oops, sorry, let me go back to agricultural trade. And you can see a lot of red here. And, you know, the red represents a total value of merchandise imports as reported uh, of, of food and agricultural imports, not merchandise imports uh, from Cuba. And then the green represents um, on the graph the total value of merchandise exports, and this is in pesos using a, uh, an exchange rate of parity between pesos and between Cuban pesos and the dollar. So for all intended purposes, you can say, well, this, if you accept that parity um, between the two currencies, uh, you can say, well, these are dollars. And whether, regardless of the currency, it's obvious that Cuba has a very large trade deficit in terms of merchandise trade deficit, but also in terms of agricultural products, food and agricultural products. We don't have here the composition of trade, but it's no secret that Cuba imports a significant portion of food and agricultural products from the United States. And I believe uh, uh, Bill Messina will discuss that in more detail. He's going to uh, talk about the, these trends in more detail than what I'm presenting here. But the bottom line is that you can see here that import in 2019 are about 20 agricultural imports or imports of food and agricultural products are pretty close to 20% of total merchandise import in terms of value, not volume, but value. So this is the background. And then that's gonna bring us to the, the central theme of our paper, which is you know our description, our analysis so far on what's been published on Cuba's um, food and nutritional sovereignty program. Now, so, here I wrote it, we wrote it in Spanish and we translated it to English as well. Um, what is a concept of food sovereignty as Cuba sees that concept? And what's important from, I'm, I'm going to uh, focus on the definition in English. What's, what you can take away from here, the main takeaway uh, in relation to our, our, our research is, that one major objective here, or one major component of this plan is the reduction of dependence on external resources and inputs, right? So the idea goes back, it, it, it reminded me right away when we started looking at this uh, food and nutritional sovereignty plan of the, uh, the, uh, the Plan Alimentario that was um, implemented in 1989, 1990, the so-called food plant, uh, plan, not plant, food plan uh, implemented by Cuba to be able to uh, back, going back 30 years to, to, to exactly accomplish what's being uh, purported here, which is to reduce the country's dependence on, on, extern on the external sector in terms of agricultural input, but also in terms, not, not just input or intermediate goods, but also finished uh, goods and so on. So, so here's a very basic view of this food sovereignty plan. Now, the components, right? So I have a lot of bullet points here. We prepared this table um, based on the information that Cuba has made available. And I, I want to uh, just talk about the components very briefly and then move on to our conclusions in the interest of time. Uh, so the components, um, the components are, first of all, a sustainable production model. I have about two minutes to, to finish this. So the sustainable production model, that's one component. The second component is trans called transformation and commercialization. So clearly here, Cuba is trying to push uh, some reforms or assuming that they're going to uh, push some reforms in uh, the distribution of agricultural products. Component number three, 
uh, it's called access to resources. And, and this is the one that really has more of the economics uh, based component. And in essence, what they're talking about here is import substitution, integrating supply chains, uh, bringing know-how and uh, you know connecting international cooperation and national cooperation and so forth and so on. And then the fourth component, it's more of a softer component, which is basically nutritional education uh, and it's, it deals with educating the population based on gender, based on age and so on about uh, what are the best practices to obtain optimal nutritional outcomes. So, so this is a very broad picture that we have here. And then, uh, so what, oops, what are the prospects that we see? Well, let, let me hurry up here because I, I'm running out of time and I want to respect the time constraint that, that we all have here. But, you know, the obviously there's so many issues that remain unresolved. These are issues that have been mentioned by many of us throughout the years uh, who study Cuban agriculture. So, um, and the food and nutritional uh, and sovereignty program does represent an attempt to address these issues. But in our view, Cuba really needs deeper agricultural reforms to accomplish, you know, a, a greater degree of, you know, domestic food production and to reduce that trading balance in agriculture. So that summarizes our conclusions. I want to thank you all for, for giving us the opportunity to expose our paper in this panel. And I'll be happy to take any questions after, during the Q&A se session and beyond. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much, Mario and Armando. It was a fantastic uh, presentation. You've, I've, I've got a million questions for you, but um, we'll, we'll defer to our audience. And with that, we've got a great segue um, with uh, Bill Messina, uh, who will be speaking about Cuba's agricultural production and trade patterns, good news or bad news. Uh, Bill is an agricultural economist with the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Services. He's been collaborating with economist colleagues at the University of Havana for over 25 years, assessing the challenges and opportunities that may arise for Cuban, Florida, and U.S. agriculture as U.S. policy changes and changes and changes. Um, take it away, Bill. You have to unmute. There we go. Okay. Can you see my PowerPoint? No. No, not yet. How about now? Nope. Huh. All right. What am I doing wrong here? Open it on your desktop first and make sure that it's open. And it's open. I see yeah. it on my screen. Yeah. All right. And then at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's a share, the green share screen button in the middle. I thought I clicked that. Yeah. Now I got a screen. Sorry about the technical issues here. There we go. There we go. Got it. Excellent. You would think I'd be better at this after as much as we've been using Zoom over the last 10 months or so. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks to all of you who are logged on. Um, and special thanks to Larry and to Gary and Jorge Perez Lopez, I'm sure, who was involved for uh, organizing this event. And uh, thanks also to Mario for uh, organizing this particular pattern. Now, despite the theme of the meeting uh, this year or this session, uh, this, this program, I'm not here to suggest policy changes or anything um, to Cuban government authorities. There are a lot of really talented, uh, very knowledgeable uh, economists in Cuba who can do that far better than a gringo from Florida like me. Uh, rather, what I'm going to try and do is maybe build on some of the uh, material and information that Mario presented to give a sense of where they are. Um, and I'm afraid the news isn't that great. You know, I'm always puzzled when you're flying into Cuba, um, 
the, the, the soil looks so rich and the fields look like they're lined out well and well kept. And it's hard to reconcile that with the fact that uh, agricultural production situation in Cuba is, is really quite dismal. Um, this is a graph that I've used on more than one occasion in uh, uh, ASCII meetings. And uh, you can see that after some improvements in total agricultural output uh, in the early 2000s, things have really declined and sort of bounced around um, uh, at, an, at a not a very efficient uh, or not a very productive level. Uh, you've got roots and tuber production. You can see some fluctuation there. That's the red bar at the bottom. You got the brown bar, which is vegetable production. Uh, bright green bar is corn. Uh, rice is, uh, is yellow. Uh, there's a dark blue bar for legumes, and that's changed a little bit, a little bit of expansion in recent years. Uh, if on the left-hand bar, there's a dark green bar for citrus, and it's pretty substantial, and you can hardly even see it on the right-hand bar, and that's a reflection of the fact that their citrus industry uh, has been devastated by citrus greening, much the same as, as ours here in Florida, although they have fewer resources to combat it than we do here in Florida. And then the uh, light purple bar there is, uh, is other fruits, but the production volumes don't seem very impressive. Now this is non-sugar agri agricultural production. Let's talk for just a minute about sugar. And we're all familiar with uh, Cuba's, the, the, the collapse of Cuba's sugar industry. 1989-90, they produced about 8.4 million metric, metric tons of sugar. At that time, they were the third largest sugar producer in the world behind Brazil and India, most of which are much larger, uh, or both of which are much larger than Cuba in terms of geographic area. But both Brazil and India consume most of their sugar domestically. So Cuba was far and away the world's largest uh, uh, sugar exporter back at that time. 2010-11, um, their citrus, uh, their sugar production had fallen to about 1.1 million tons, lowest in about a century. But by 2014-15, it had increased to 1.8 million tons. What happened? Hey, that's a 60% increase in four seasons. True, it's not anywhere close to what it was uh, in the late 1980s, but it's still a substantial increase. And while the Cubans will tell you there's a lot of uh, reasons for that, I think the primary reason is, is Brazilian investment. And I want to talk about that for just a minute. Uh, these are some photographs we, had, uh, we took on a trip in October of 2011 to a, a sugar uh, farm. Brand new Brazilian harvesters, state-of-the-art equipment, brand new hose reel and center pivot irrigation systems, new field tractors, uh, carts to haul the cane from the field to the, to the mill. And Brazil had also invested in uh, refurbishing a Cuban sugar mill and managing its operations. My point here is that the Brazilian investment had a very clear uh, and significant impact. Sugar is really the only agricultural commodity sector uh, uh, in Cuba that's experienced any significant growth over the last 30 years. Since that 14-15 season, it's actually fallen back to about 1.1, 1.2 million tons for the last few seasons. Uh, some of that's weather related, some of that's just logistics, um, the, the whole host of problems that you typically run into. But the point is that this is a, a clear demonstration that foreign investment has the potential uh, to have some significant impacts in Cuba's agricultural sector. Investment or capital, if you want to talk about the factors of production, it's key in Cuba. You know, your three factors of production are land, labor, and capital. Cuba's got a lot of land, good natural resource base, uh, labor. They've got very knowledgeable farmers. What they're clearly lacking is capital. Um, I think Brazil's experience could easily be uh, replicated in other commodities, but the question is which ones? And the reason I say that is much of the foreign direct investment that's gone into Cuban agriculture and, and the food sector has been for products that, for export. You had the Israelis in the early 1990s and citrus and some other Latin American countries also in, uh, involved in the citrus industry. French firm invested in shellfish processing in Cuba, again, for export. Uh, the British in cigars for export, uh, Pernod Richard and rum for export. Um, there has been some money invested in rice in recent years, but it's really been more a function of foreign aid that has, than it has been foreign direct investment, which suggests that 
it's going to be kind of a short term rather than a long term, uh, have a short term rather than potentially a long term impact. And then the big question, who's going to invest um, with the Helms Burton Title III lawsuits uh, uh, able to be pursued out there was spoken about in the session this morning. Um, I think that's a real question mark. Um, now let's move on to Cuban trade. And this is uh, U.S. This is U.S. food and agricultural exports to Cuba from 2000 to 2020. Um, reached $700 million in 2008. Now that was a little bit of a, uh, an anomaly, uh, but you can see that it's declined, so a few increases. Uh, 2020 here is projected based on the data for the first 10 months of the year. Um, not looking nearly as promising as it did in the early years, but from the standpoint of U.S. agriculture, it has totaled almost six and a half billion dollars, and that is not insignificant um, in in the context of U.S. agricultural trade. That's a that's a nice new market for uh, for U.S. agriculture. Now, this is a graph of Cuba's food and agricultural imports by country or region, uh, 2000 through 2000. I've got 2020 estimated there, but uh, or not estimated. It's uh, data through September. Um, uh, 2000, the Trade Sanctions Reform and Export Enhancement Act was passed by the U.S. and signed by the president, allowing the sale of food and medicine to Cuba. U.S. Uh, sales to Cuba that year were zero. Cuba didn't start importing until November of 2001. You can't see it, but there's a little sliver of red at the bottom of the uh, stack there for 2001. Um, and then you can see the U.S. Um, has been a fairly significant, for a while there was a fairly significant um, uh, supplier for Cuba. You've got Brazil in dark blue, the 27 countries of the European Union um, in, 20, uh, in green. Um, Croatia was added as the 28th. Um, don't include the, the Croatian data there, and it was negligible, if, if not zero. Uh, you can see Argentina in 2000. 13, starting to become a, a bigger participant, and then all the other countries of the world uh, later there. Um, so I mentioned the TISRA uh, legislation, the trade sanctions legislation allowing the sale of food and medicine, but I want to look at who are Cuba's main food suppliers. Uh, by 2002, the first shipments to Cuba were 2001. In 2002, the very next year, the U.S. was Cuba's most important supplier of food and agricultural products as a single country. European Union together was uh, in many years more significant. Um, between 2002 and 2013, the U.S. was Cuba's number one food supplier in every year but one. So we're, um, even with the embargo in place, we're a major supplier to Cuba. Um, since that time, Cuba's major food and import suppliers have varied some. Um, this is a, a, a interesting graphic, I think. Uh, you get the European Union there consistently from 2015 through 2020. They're the largest supplier, the 28 European Union countries now. Um, in 2015, Brazil had taken over the number one spot. U.S. had fallen to number three. Uh, 2016, Brazil fell to number three. Argentina moved up. The U.S. was number two. Then U.S. moved up. So you can see those three countries were sort of in the mix. Uh, 2018, all of a sudden, Mexico uh, comes into the mix and Canada uh, a little more actively. Argentina drops out uh, or drops down. 2019, um, Mexico, Canada still in the, in the mix there. Uh, interestingly, 2020, Uruguay came in as the third largest supplier. <coughs> Pardon me. So it's been kind of a mix of, uh, of suppliers. Um, the top five food suppliers typically for the last five, six years have typically represent about three quarters of Cuba's total food imports. If you look at the top 10 suppliers, they represent between 93 and 96% of Cuba's total food imports. Between 2015 and 2020, other countries that have been among Cuba's top 10 food suppliers, and these are in alphabetical order, they don't represent uh, uh, their, their relative importance or anything. You've got Chile, China, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, New Zealand, uh, a little surprising halfway around the world, uh, although they provide, um, typically provide a lot of uh, uh, powdered milk and dry dairy products into Cuba, uh, and even Russia has gotten in there. Are they getting paid? Are the suppliers getting paid? Well, the U.S. exporters are getting paid because the Helms-Burton legislation requires uh, cash payment. So, 
uh, there's no credit risk for U.S. exporters, which is another reason why U.S. farmers are pretty excited about the market in Cuba. And interestingly, they, there are groups out there that are promoting uh, allowing credit sales to Cuba, but individual farmers that I talk to are pretty comfortable with the cash payment terms. Uh, and, and they like not being put on the spot because if, if the Cuban customer asks them for credit, they say, oh, we'd like to be able to help you, but uh, uh, you know we can't because of US regulations. There've been a lot of reports of Cuba failing to make payment obligations. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, the most notable is really the uh, default on their Paris Club payment, um, uh, which, which may, caught a lot of press. What hasn't caught as much press? Um, Vietnam has, uh, <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Vietnam has been selling Cuba rice on 12 and 18 month and even 24 month terms. And they defaulted on some of the payments, even on those extended terms. Similarly, there've been defaults on payments for rice from Thailand. So uh, the payment situation is not looking particularly promising. Prospects for the future, I'm gonna say uncertain at best. And the reason I said that is think back to the lineamientos in 2011. Um, that was the, the, the ag agricultural chapter in the lineamientos was the second longest in the entire document. Uh, there was some fluff in there, but there were some very sub, uh, substantive private sector um, policy provisions including in there, uh, included in there. Um, but they've only, they haven't been able to implement nearly as many of them as, as they had hoped, certainly. Um, giving access to idle land is good, but the problem is if a farmer gets um, idle land that's covered with matabu, uh, he or she doesn't really have much of a way to remove that matabu. It's a very uh, difficult plant to, to eradicate. Um, and then the next question is, even if you get the Matabu change uh, uh, out of some of the land, you go to an agricultural input store, which were new, which relatively new, uh, following the lineamientos. Um, rubber boots and machetes are helpful uh, in farming, but what the growers really need are seeds and fertilizers, and they're in especially short supply in the, uh, in the input stores, if they're available at all. Um, the Plan San, uh, again, I think of the lineamientos. There's an a article in Grandma that, that uh, I've got a quote here. They talked about developing the Plan San. Representatives of 22 ministries, 11 business groups, 25 science, technology, and innovation entities, 10 civil society organizations, and five international organizations worked for more than a year in the preparation of the San Plan and that, which includes background information, diagnosis, methodology, conceptual framework, and an action plan. Sounds to me like an awful lot of, of <laughs> varied input, um, but it's not gonna mean anything unless the Cuban bureaucrats in Minaga are willing to implement ag policy reforms. And I think that was a big part of the problem um, with the lineamientos. It's very difficult to, uh, for some of them to make changes. Um, yesterday, we they were talking about the Cuban bureaucracy and uh, the issue came up. This may be a rough quote. Uh, it seems they have the intention, but not the will. Um, I think that was made both in reference to Cuban bureaucrats and foreign investors in Cuba. The Cuban government clearly recognizes that incentives work. You look at the shelves in the ration store, they're empty. You look at the uh, Mercados Agropecuarios, um, and when you consider the, the lack of resources the Cubans have, um, the supplies of food in the, in the uh, uh, agro markets um, are really quite impressive. The quality, the supply, the variety, expensive for the average Cuban, that's the problem. Uh, but the government has to recognize that incentives work. Um, whether they're able to figure out a way to allow those implementation, the implementation of some policies to allow the incentives to work is uh, remains to be seen, certainly. Uh, but I'm afraid that past experience over the last 26 years, I guess it's been now since we've been working in Cuba, um, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You look at all the policy uh, changes that were implemented in, in Mario's wonderful presentation there. Um, 
he does some great work and he works with Armando Nova, who's one of our colleagues down there and uh, both fantastic uh, economists doing some really interesting work. But the prospects for the future, I'm afraid, unless, unless there's a major change in philosophy, I'm just not overly optimistic that we're gonna see any dramatic improvement. Oh, the one, one thing I wanted to mention in the graph where we looked at two, Cuba's total food imports, the bar for 2020, for the first nine months of 2020, was considerably shorter than the bar for 2019. And that's good news and bad news. The good news is Cuba's import bill is going to be lower this year. But Cuba's importing somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 70 percent of its total food supply. Uh, when your imports fall by that much, that is going to create problems in terms of food supply. And clearly, we're seeing it now, and we're hearing stories about it now uh, from Cuba. So with that, I'll finish up. I hope I was within my time frame there, Larry. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions and discussion. Well, thank you very, very much, Bill. Um, great presentation. Um, we move next to uh, Juan Tomas Sanchez. Um, who will be speaking to us about la tarea ordenamiento y el cultivo de la tierra. Um, Juan is a graduate civil engineer from the University of Miami in Coral Gables. He's a registered professional engineer in the state of Florida, uh, and he lives and practices in Coral Gables. He's worked for local and multinational pharmaceutical and engineering companies in the areas of design and project management and capital projects, and represents the association of sugarcane growers of Cuba uh, since designated in 1998 by those elected in the association's last democratic elections in Cuba in 1960. Sanchez regularly publishes in journals and makes personal presentations about sugar with emphasis on world market conditions and the future of the sugarcane agribusiness in Cuba under rule of law, a private economy and separation of powers. Other subjects include labor relations and practices before 1959 and future projections. He's a longtime member of ASCII, thank you, uh, and a regular contributor and presenter since 1996. Thank you, thank you. Uh, he informs a group of the principal participants in the construction of the sugar agribusiness of the future in Cuba, among them families of owners of sugar mills, farms, labor leaders, academics, economists, and members of civil society in general. The topics are as varied as the industry as a whole, namely, it includes world events related to sugar, ethanol, and co-generation of electricity from surplus uh, bagasse, trade, and statistics. And with that, um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. It's going to be a sugar-free presentation. <laughs> Let me see if I can... Uh, can can you see me now or no? I yeah, think we can see I you, but not the presentation. Uh, go back to the presentation, split screen. There we go. And then now we are. There you go. Okay. Um, my presentation basically is going to be in Spanish, but maybe the opening remarks. Uh, I have to uh, really thank uh, Jorge Perez Lopez, Gary, and and Larry for making this possible and very, very efficient, very well uh, produced. And uh, also the Silvia and Silvia for their background work uh, all these months. Um, I get an inspiration from Jorge Sanguinetti's presentation uh, um, a day or two ago when he said that uh, in his presentation, two things. Uh, he would like to do it in Spanish in case someone in Cuba heard it and uh, want to do something about it. And the other thing that Jorge Sanguinetti did was a, a little view of the past. So I'm going to do both. I'm going to do in Spanish and I'm going to present uh, with a little uh, vista of uh, what happened in Cuba before a revolution to put the things in, uh, in perspective. Um, so basically, um, there's a groundwork that I follow and was the requisites for the conference where it says uh, reforms inside of what the authors uh, estimate that the Cuban government 
could do or could be ready to do. Uh, basically, that's very important. I think when we have a crisis like we have now in agriculture in Cuba, basically is not an elephant in the living room, it's uh, an elephant in una cristalería. Uh, any, any movement uh, down is a, is a disaster. And then second, I take inspiration in Pedro Monreal's where he says, uh, it'd be good if the experts in agriculture explain the footfalls in the uh, uh, agricultural politic. Uh, and uh, they have suggested to double the, the area in Mayabeque, which is the area south of the province of Havana, that is the, the food basket of, of Cuba, uh, rather than increase the area Pedro Monreal hopes that they can increase the yield to the level of 2014 and 2015. So basically, I take a look at, at the past, like Jorge recommended. And uh, between 1957 and 1961, the yields, in, and I have there a lot of basic uh, commodities, arroz, maíz, frijoles, boniato, and I scribble myself here to let you know that the drop in those three years was uh, was 42 percent, and even here, a Vice Minister of the, la, uh, la Agencia de la Reforma Agraria, uh, he's uh, surprised that they have had a drop of 50 percent in in corn. Um, so that's a view of the past, but uh, that was possible that there was uh, fairly high yields in Cuba uh, because there were three conditions that made it possible. Las tres condiciones que lo hacían posible entonces e improbable hoy es que durante muchos años, yo no sé desde cuándo, el peso y el dólar estuvieron uh, al, a la par. Eso dejaba establecido una gran garantía a la hora de invertir en Cuba y también fue una gran protección al salario de los que menos salarios ganaban, de que no estaban expuestos a lo que estaba pasando en el resto de Latinoamérica, que cualquier devaluación te reducía tu ingreso real en las dos terceras partes. Otra cosa que imperaba, decía las condiciones posibles, era el estado de derecho que había. Y la tercera es que había libre asociación. Los sindicatos eran fuertes, las asociaciones de productores eran fuertes. Eh, nosotros pertenecíamos a la de cosecheros y exportadores de frutas y vegetales. Eh, el transporte, a, había libertad de asociación. Hoy en Cuba no hay una sola en la que su dirección haya sido libremente elegida. Eh, pero sin embargo, quiero dejar aclarado que el mercado nacional para el agricultor eh, padecía de inmensas distorsiones. Era muy difícil eh, llegar al a los mercados de La Habana con una producción que no haya sido financiada por lo que se llamaban los placeros, los dueños de los puestos en el, en el mercado. Ellos no querían competencia. Y así, después de varios eh, defraudes, eh, nos dirigimos, como mi padre, a la exportación de frutas y vegetales que también tenía sus problemas y uno de los problemas grandes era que solamente había un ferry que era el de Mr. Taylor, que cuando se lo prestaba un amigo pues no podía llegar ese día al mercado de Pompano y Batista después rechazó el que se llevaran a Cuba las plataformas para llevar los trailers con aire acondicionado como venía todos los productos desde México hasta la costa este. O sea, ayer y hoy la producción agrícola a escala lleva altos riesgos que no puede absorber el agricultor. Eh, cualquier siembra de un poquito de, de envergadura eh, puede llevar una inversión de 150 a 200 mil dólares. Eh, rara vez un agricultor puede hacer eso. Nosotros corríamos ciertos riesgos porque teníamos el respaldo de la caña de azúcar que era bastante estable. Pero en sí, el, el agricultor eh, le es muy difícil llegar a la capacidad económica rentable 
eh, sin tener un socio capitalista que esté dispuesto a correr el riesgo. Eh, ahora vamos a entrar en el meollo de la cosa. Hay una crisis alimenticia en Cuba. Por el otro lado, los que están preocupados por eh, la inflación, eh, aunque Cuba multiplique por cinco eh, los sueldos, la, la inflación es el, el mayor enemigo, la producción agrícola es el mayor enemigo que tiene o el mejor amigo que tiene eh, la inflación. Y hay eh, una perspectiva muy seria, aunque la FAO hable de 5.500 calorías, también hay el estudio que lo detallaré más en la presentación por escrito, en la que más adelante enseñaré los resultados de esa investigación en la que uso una metodología muy interesante llamada etnocontabilidad. Eh, en otro momento hablamos de eso. Pero esto es lo que ellas eh, evalúan dos familias. La, una familia Vázquez que recibe eh, eh, remesas del extranjero y una familia Valdés que no la recibe. Pero en ambos casos, el porciento, y es lo importante que tiene la agricultura en la realidad cubana, es que lo, que se, lo que hay que gastarse para llevarlo a la mesa es más de un 50% del ingreso mensual. Eso es una barbaridad, eh, pero bueno, es la realidad que hay allí. Eh, la otra tabla que ellos publican es, por ejemplo, la familia Vázquez, que es la que recibe remesas, como ellos compran muy, po muy poquito de su alimentación, es por la, la, la libreta de racionamiento. Mira lo que, lo, el porciento de su ingreso que consumen en, lo, en los shopping en CUC y en los mercados agropecuarios y en el mercado negro. Y la otra familia que, que no recibe remesas, fíjese que en la shopping no compra nada, todo va algo en el mercado negro, algo regalado y esos son los pesos gastados. Eh, es una situación que hay que tener en mente cuando hablamos de la eh, situación alimenticia que, que padece Cuba. Este fue el cálculo de la FAO, 3.000, 3.400, 3.500. Pero este es el cálculo de estos estudios, de estas dos familias, en las que ustedes verán que en el, el, el 2010, 2011, 2012, la, aquí me faltó el otro dato, era la mitad de lo que dice la FAO, la mitad de lo que se estima en Cuba. Lo mismo para la familia que recibía eh, remesas. De, no es mucho más, no, no se alimentan mucho más, no hay mucha más opción de, de comida. Eh, hago énfasis en esto porque esto es el fondo de la cuestión que, se, que amenaza a, a Cuba. Eh, entonces, ¿dónde está el problema? Quiero dejar aclarado que el cultivo de la tierra no se resuelve ni en el mercado ni el Estado. Es un negocio de ambos. Es un balance extremadamente difícil de lograr. Cuando vemos toda la inversión que hace los Estados Unidos y que hace Europa, que es la que se, la que se conoce en subsidio a la agricultura, que tiene que pagarlo el resto de la, de la población también, pero es muy importante llegar a lograr algún tipo de balance, como se logra en los Estados Unidos y en Europa, en que el costo de la alimentación no es el 50, el 60% del ingreso, del ingreso mensual. Eh, ante esta situación tan difícil, lo que estoy tratando de plantear aquí es que inevitablemente que está entrando en Cuba la solución que necesita el tipo Plan Marshall dentro de lo que el gobierno cubano esté dispuesto a hacer, como dice el dogma de ASCII para esta conferencia. Dentro del gobierno cubano, quien único ha podido atraer inversión extranjera de verdad es a esa. Yo me imagino que estaremos de acuerdo que toda esa in 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 inversión inmobiliaria que ha logrado GAESA eh, ha sido exitosa, al menos ha sido cuantiosa. Ascuba, la, el subministerio cubano del, del azúcar, brilla por su ausencia. Como decía Bill Messina, no, no está pasando de un millón o 1.2 millones de toneladas. Eh, lo, Gaesa no se deja gobernar. Eh, 
eh, debería de ser Larry required hearing your interview with Jorge Dominguez on uh, last week that you did because we need to understand uh, first that the constitution in Cuba has an article to promote the investment, uh, the foreign investment. And then the next uh, chapter is basically to control everything else that is produced uh, nationally in my own terms. And also in that interview, Larry, uh, Jorge Dominguez from, from Harvard, explain what happened when the cuentapropistas get too successful and Gaesa uh, gets jealous. And uh, they have a very strong control in the, in the government. Uh, then, si la reconstrucción del cultivo de la tierra cae en manos del primer ministro y del ministro de agricultura, se lo traga la burocracia. Eh, no tengo que enseñarle a nadie que la inflación empieza por el costo de la comida en un país en que la alimentación que sea se traga entre el 50 y el 75 del ingreso, sea por sueldo, por cuenta propia o por remesas. Eh, 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 recientemente en un artículo de Juventud Rebelde eh, dice que producir más es la única solución. Estoy de acuerdo. Pero ahí en la declaración de, del ministro Dice que eh, al cierre de octubre se lograron vender tantas libras de autoabastecimiento eh, que lo que resultó una merma del 33%. El artículo está ahí, ya cuando se publique el artículo, eh, los links quedarán mejor escritos. Eh, gracias a Tamaris Beamón de Pérez, porque mi énfasis es en qué es lo que puede hacer Gaesa. Aquí es para recordarle, Gaesa es el MINFAR, Ministerio de las Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias. Este es el poderío de, de Gaesa. Esto no lo tiene nadie en Cuba. Esto no lo tiene los ministerios. Esto no lo tiene acopio. Ellos no necesitan eh, de nadie para resolver el problema, de la, tratar de resolver el problema de la, de la agricultura en Cuba. Eh, gracias, Tamaris, por dejarme usar sin tu permiso eh, tu, tu presentación. Entonces, ¿quién es Gaesa? Gaesa es Luis Alberto Rodríguez y López Calleja, general de brigada. No creo que ningún ministro ni ningún primer ministro se vaya a interponer si Gaesa decide hacerte, hacerse cargo de la administración de la agricultura en Cuba y ponerlo a cierto nivel en la que pueda haber eh, una mejor alimentación para todos. En sí, yo creo que yo no tengo mucho más que decir eh, y eso es, eso es todo, Larry. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, gracias, Bill. Gracias, Mario. Eh, gracias a to todos por eh, dejarme participar en este panel eh, que es mi favorito todos los años. Gracias, Larry. No, gracias, Ted. It was fabulous presentation. Thank you so, so much. Um, we move on now to our final presentation of, of the afternoon, uh, John Martinez Herrera, uh, who will be speaking to us about land and peasants in Cuba to have and to hold. Um, he is a lecturer in business law at the University of Miami Herber Business School, where he teaches business courses. Uh, prior to joining the school, he was a visiting assistant professor of law at the University of Miami School of Law, where he taught the law of obligations and international family law. He previously been a member of the faculty at the University of Havana. He holds a JD magna cum laude from the University of Miami and a, lic a licenciado en derecho degree with honors from the University of Havana. In addition, he's practiced as a litigator and in the areas of business law and real estate. His current research interests include contracts and international laws affecting US businesses. He's appeared multiple times as a legal commentator in regional, national, and international press and he's received the Excellence in Teaching Award at the Miami Herbert Business uh, School on several occasions. And congratulations for that. And let's hear about land and peasants who shouldn't have, who don't exist officially, I imagine, since at least the end of the 50s. 
Thank you, Larry. Um, good afternoon, and thank you. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here in Tipana Long Agriculture uh, and, and the conference. Uh, so thank you, Mario, for the welcome uh, and the warm uh, words. Uh, my presentation, uh, my research article started with the idea of um, this notion of who were the small, uh, small farmers in Cuba or the peasants and the peasantry and the land and uh, sort of like to approach the relationship from the ownership perspective and the possessor perspective. I have to admit that after hearing these wonderful presentations, I, I not only gonna be talking about this, but I learned a lot from all of you. Um, very interesting presentations. So uh, the scope of the research is very narrow. It is uh, to uh, examine that relationship between uh, small farmers, and, and I'll, say, I'll say it in a minute, why peasants, in my opinion, include both, not only those small farmers owning the land, right, that legally belong to them, they survived the first and the second uh, laws of agrarian reform, but uh, some of them were actually given land by the agrarian reform, but also includes the word peasant, those that possess land. They're not the owners, right? And in my, in my concept, I include this uh, notion of uh, tenure, land tenure. They possess the land uh, for cultivation and subsistence. So this is less likely to be land for agricultural production and commercialization, business purposes. So the scope of the article, again, is very, very narrow. And I treat peasants as the small farmers, those who suffer queries in the decade uh, of the 90s but also the small farmers, the traditional small farmers on the Cuban law, agricultores pequeños, right? That they are uh, under Cuban law still, uh, they remain as owners of the property. And then I pose this question of uh, to have and to hold. Uh, this is a very old English phrase. Uh, to hold on behalf of the Lord, uh, to have it means to possess. So what does it mean in Cuba and under the complexities of uh, the Cuban realities, uh, to have and to hold land, either as a small farmer being the owner or as a small farmer being the usufructuary. Uh, I um, only use this, uh, the purpose of the article is not to uh, offer a critique on the agrarian reform, uh, nothing like that, but I use this report on the critical analysis of the agrarian reform to uh, draw some uh, conclusions and interesting data and many of you have said it, that uh, agricultural production in Cuba was predominantly for the sugarcane industry. And then um, most farms, even before the agrarian reform were small farms. So uh, you have uh, more than 100,000 uh, in 15% of the total land and more than 16,000 uh, medium farms up to uh, five uh, caballerias. 67.1 hectares were also uh, small farms, right? So it's uh, the, the notion that small farms were after the revolution is questionable. There were many small farms before and with the agrarian reform, first and second law of agrarian reform, what happened is that they established a maximum with the first uh, agrarian reform law of 30 caballerias or 402.6 hectares. And under the second agrarian reform law of 1963, that went even further, right? And they established a maximum of uh, five caballerias. The rest was expropriated and it went either to uh, state hands, uh, the, what then they call granjas estatales, cooperative form of ownership. And, and, and I guess I'm answering one of the questions. And, and also it went uh, to private hands, right? To the peasantry. So um, then, having said that, uh, what is the current state of uh, the law in this area? Who are the small farmers, right? And who are the, 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 the peasants, Larry, back to your question. Well, it's predominantly in this pyramid, calcium pyramid under Cuban law. We have the constitution of, uh, from 2019 and the civil code of 1987 clashing these two bodies of regulation. Then you have the decree law of 125 dealing specifically with small farmers and uh, the treatment of 
these uh, property laws, right? And then resolutions and, and regulamentos implementing this decree law. And then you have uh, also the decree law of 358. And thank you, Mario, because you mentioned that in the latest, latest reform. Now, this has suffered so many changes and amendments, uh, 259, 259, then 300, then 358. That's the one I'm going about because it's the most recent. Maybe it will, it will change. Uh, before the article is published. And this uh, decree law 358 of 2018 deals with the use of, of state-owned idle lands. Now, these are also, in my opinion, small, uh, small farmers, right? Uh, so let's talk about the constitution and the civil code one, then uh, 125 and then 358. Under the constitution, the problem is that the socialist property of the entire people is the predominant form of property in Cuba. So uh, they don't, it's not that they don't recognize private property, but private property, what it's there in, under the framework of the 2019 constitution has a complementary role. And I think Bill was mentioning this, isn't the lineamientos, isn't the economic guidelines of the PCC, uh, the communist party. So private property over some means of production by natural persons is there, but what does that mean? That they're not expressly saying agricultores pequeños, the, law, the, the, the land of agricultores pequeños. They're not saying that. They're saying private property over some means of production uh, by uh, natural persons with a complementary role in the economy. Article 29 says private property over land is regulated by special laws. I can fairly assume that this is a decree law 125, what they're talking about here. It says that they prohibit usufruct, right? Between private parties, not the usufruct permitted by or with the Cuban state. And that is the usufruct that was given of state-owned the lands uh, under decree law 358. And now the civil code of 1987 recognizes, now remember the civil code is from 1987. This is the new constitution. The constitution from 1976 has uh, the language of the civil code from 1987. And it does recognize, spells out uh, expressly the property of small farmers or agricultores pequeños. This property uh, includes the lands that legally belong to them, quote unquote. Article 151 also includes the buildings, the facilities, means and instruments that are necessary for the exploitation to which they are dedicated. This property also includes the animals. It includes plantations, sowings, fruits, and other agricultural and forestry products that legally belong to the small farmers in property. Then article uh, 152.1 says, small farmers are obligated to maintain, exploit, and properly use the land that failure to comply with our just cause can lead to the expropriation of their assets. That the state has a preferential right for the acquisition by paying the legal price if they decide to sell. They can sell uh, unless they sell to the state, right? Or exchange the land with another agricultor pequeño. But it has to be with the uh, consent of the state. And if they sell, the state has a preferential right in the purchase. So let me uh, briefly go over and by no means I intend to, I'm the lawyer in the room, intend to uh, bug you with so many, so many articles and, and decrees. Uh, that's not the purpose of the presentation. It's just to highlight some of the challenges, right? Of uh, what I call small farmers slash peasants in Cuba who own the lands. This is the first part. These people, uh, according to the constitution slash civil code slash decree law 125, they are the owners of their piece of land and the means of production. So it says uh, this decree, chapter four, establishes the precepts concerning the land of small farmers. Article six in particular says that this land is indivisible. It means they cannot uh, divide unless there is uh, the saying of the Ministry of Agriculture, right? That uh, under article eight, they have the obligations to exploit the land according to the regulations of the Ministry of Agriculture. It is important, this article, in my opinion, because it says that it has to be done in the interest of the economic and social development of the country. 
and it uh, is a, a reason, a, a violation of this article, uh, says Article 9, may be the negligent abandonment of the land by, by the small farmer. Uh, if they hire workers, that may constitute a violation of Article 8. If they don't sell to state entities, that's uh, Article 9, letter C. If they don't sell to state entities, I, I fairly assume that that is a copy uh, or the state collector. Uh, the, com the illicit commercialization of uh, agricultural productions, meaning they sell or buy on their own, it's a violation of uh, this article. And if they don't use the property in the fundamental line of production that was established. So um, the last uh, letter of this article nine, it's important because the violation of the first five, if it is grave, if it is serious, it may give a reason for the forced expropriation of the land. Now, the last, it, it doesn't have to even be serious. It is a forced expropriation if they divide the land, a parcerias, if they lease the land, if they sublease the land that belongs to them, that gives violation to the forced expropriation. Another interesting uh, feature is that that necessity for, uh, or the public purpose, giving rise to force expropriation cannot be contested in court. So there is no recourse to contest that process of force expropriation against a small farmer. Interesting, interestingly enough, uh, section three covers the transfer of property upon the death of the small, small farmer. And I think there is a, a broad consensus between Cuban law professors and, and, and many of them have published extensively about this, that there is a problem. There is a problem with uh, the succession of the land of small farmers uh, because there is no agrarian courts. If there is a dispute between the heirs to the land, let's say, they can contest this in court, right? So that's number one. Number two, there is a problem because uh, if you work the land for five years prior to the death of the decedent, right? The owner of the farm, uh, then you may become an heir to the land. You have to work in, in a form that is stable, in a form that is permanent, says Article 18, five years prior to the death of the small farmer. Now, uh, the requirement of you have the land is for those who work the land number one, but not only that, you have to work permanently in the land for five years prior to the uh, death of the small farmer. And you are the father, the brothers, sisters, siblings, the surviving spouse. If you are uh, article, under Article 20, if you are uh, at the moment of the death of the small farmer, you were not working the land because you were disabled or you were studying or you were uh, not of age, right? And these people will get the price the share will be evaluated and they get the price. Now, who gets the price in the Article 20? The surviving spouse, number one. Number two, the parents. And then they talk about the daughters or the sisters of the decedent, which is kind of a, maybe Justice Ginsburg would have taken this to the Supreme Court. Uh, institutionalized sexism, if you ask me. Uh, like similar to the Moritz the case where they deny the 63 single, uh, son, uh, caretaker of a mother, a tax allowance back in the days. And Justice Ginsburg just fought this as discriminatory. So let it be the parents, the daughters, or the sisters. It means that uh, in Cuba, daughters and sisters, is, they're less likely to own or to be small farmers owning land. And then you have, uh, I'll stop there. This is, it, it's, a, it's a long list. And I want to talk about briefly about the public sector. In the case of the public sector, what we have is the use of fruit. And these people, in my opinion, may also become small farmers, right? In this economic or social uh, concept of, uh, of peasantry. And the state uh, decided uh, in the 90s, right? To uh, confer, authorize the delivery or the grant of Edel state land in free use of fruit for the determined period of time not only to national persons, but also to juridical persons. And that's the case of cooperatives. Now, the, the use of fruit is a contract. 
right? If this is not the land of cooperatives, UVPC, CPA, or CCS, whatever we want to call them, and it is not the land of the uh, national person. This is a contract between the state and the individual who takes on the land, right? And, and according to this Article 1.1 and the Civil Code, this is free. Now they have to pay taxes. Article 14 of Decree Law 358 says that taxes are due in the contract of use of fruit. And the, and the normal law on taxation in Cuba also assess taxes. And what are considered idle, idle state lands under Article 2? Those that are not found in agriculture. And uh, we, were, uh, we were talking about marabou. Well, those that are covered with marabou, uh, weeds or invasive plants are considered idle lands. And those dedicated to livestock production with a low load of animals per hectare, and those used for crops or plantations that are not suitable. Uh, for the suitability of the soils. These are idle state lands. Uh, I'm gonna briefly go over the concept of usufruct uh, under the civil code is the free enjoyment of the property of others with the obligation to preserve, okay, five minutes left, to preserve its form and substance on, unless the title of its constitution or the law authorizes otherwise. Uh, the rights and obligations of the usufructuary are those determined by the, cons the title of the contract uh, constituting the use of fruit. Uh, and general limitations to the right of property also apply to the right of use of fruit. A couple of interesting points that I found while I was examining the, the, the most recent legislation is this concept of a state idle land fund and what goes there. And from there, the state distributes the land a colleague uh, said uh, not long ago, this is like a reverse agrarian reform. Well, not, not really. Uh, <laughs> these are land that are abandoned for more than six months by the state entities, by usufructuaries, or those to which the usufruct for self-sufficiency have been revoked by resolution of the delegate or municipal director of agriculture in Cuba. Uh, and uh, the other ones that are in the interest of the state and the state via the expropriation, the forced expropriation acquired property. Uh, and uh, the concept of improvements of benefactions being a churias, it's called under the law, are uh, those improvements to the land and the dwelling of the usufructuary, right? Uh, but they cannot sell, right? Uh, in, my, in my paper, I argue this small farmer entitled to an usufruit cannot sell the bienechurias, so they dwell in the property, right? Spend time, money, resources building this house, then it's not, it's not really her house or his house. They can sell the bienechurias, not the, not the bienechurias may be object of usufruit or any other third party right. And the maximums as uh, Mario and, and I think Bill um, said, they've been extended under the latest uh, uh, amendments to 20 years, now there is a clash. I assume this decree law modified all of a sudden the civil code uh, because the civil code calls in, uh, uh, of 25 years for juridical persons, but the decree law says this is indefinite. They're granting this use of fruit uh, for an indefinite period of time. And article 10 is also interesting and I'm wrapping up uh, because if the use of fruit is intended for commercial purposes, then they have to buy machinery and resources and sell the production via the state sanction enterprises, the UEPC, CPA, CCS, and sell the production of these, uh, via these channels. So the, the, the small farmer can take the crops and uh, go to the uh, market in, in the municipality. Uh, last but not least, there are more than 20 reasons for terminating the contract of use of fruit under the latest decree law. And regular, you know, normal causes of extinction, mutual recession, agreement of the parties, and so on, lapse of contractual term. But if they hire workers, if they don't associate themselves to state sanction uh, entities, if they give the land unauthorized use, if they transfer to third parties, unauthorized improvements and bienesurias, all of these will give rights to the termination of the contract of use of fruit. Well, the, the, the paper, more than uh, just reviewing and examining what the concept is, is also uh, confirming, in my opinion, or, or studying that 
uh, the small farmers are twofold in Cuba, right? Those that own land, the survivors, I call them, or those that were granted title under the agrarian reforms, no more than five caballerias. But there are also other uh, kinds of uh, small farmers that they don't own the land. As a matter of fact, they are the mercy of the state. Uh, in my opinion, uh, private property, as William Taft said, it's the greatest of the incentives in, economic, uh, in economics. I would say lifting property restrictions could provide incentives to peasants and their families and boost productivity and the spirit of entrepreneurship. Now that they're talking uh, about a law on PMS, small and, and medium-sized enterprises, maybe these farmers can become the entrepreneurs, right? All of a sudden, promoting private market initiatives could facilitate the buying and selling of machinery, so much uh, needed uh, in sustainable agriculture. And last, the promotion of private market initiatives could also open supply chain mechanisms necessary for the placement of these agricultural products from the farms to the markets, which at the end of the day is one of the most crucial right, uh, issues that Cuban society is facing, putting food on the table. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very, very much on, for a very interesting uh, discussion. I'm still not sure about peasants, but um, but, <laughs> but really quite enlightening. Um, we have um, <clears throat> the, the papers actually work really well together. And I want to abuse my, my role as chair uh, by asking you, well, I've got three really fascinating questions that, that I'm gonna ask you in a little bit, but we've got a little bit of time. And so I wanna, I wanna uh, play the role of first secretary of this, uh, of this party and um, ask a question uh, of you. And, and it's a question in the form of, a, of an observation that maybe you can disabuse me of in listening to all of your papers. Um, what I've heard over the course of one, two, three, four excellent, excellent papers is a, it's a conundrum that is, that in my mind seems incapable of resolution. And that is the absolute inability within either Cuban ideology or Cuban pragmatism to bring together two intimately related but quite separable problems. And the first problem is the problem of the production of foodstuffs, food security, what is it that we're gonna grow? How can we grow the problem of Marawu, the problem of arable land, uh, the problem of are we gonna grow bananas or citrus fruits? The problem of production, it's technical, it's resource related um, as Bill uh, nicely mentioned, um, we're dealing here with issues ultimately going to the issue of maximizing the welfare of food production, uh, whether it's food security or food welfare, uh, as the state understands it. And then related to this more technical problem, the problem of food production, is the problem of the role of people in the production of food. This is John's problem of the peasant. Um, the owner. And here you're dealing with peasants, owners, co-op members, employees, but you're dealing with an intensely political and an intensely societal problem, the ideology of which can sometimes appear to be, at least in your discussions, and Mario was really good at bringing this out, uh, could be absolutely run against the imperatives of production. And so you've got these two things going on with two different sets of ideologies, the ideologies of the peasant uh, and the ideologies of the revolutionary experience of the rural areas, and then the imperatives of production in a Marxist Leninist state. Is there any way that you all see of bringing them together, of aligning them, um, or is that going to remain um, a fundamental problem of creating some sort of, of uh, coordination or coherence in Cuban agricultural policy, whether under a, uh, a Soviet Marxist style, a, a Chinese markets Marxist style, or in or uh, a more traditional uh, markets oriented style. So that's that's sort of my my question and observation, and my effort to kind of bring all of these together. And nobody wants to touch it. I'll guess. I'll, I'll guess. <laughs> let let me let me sort of um, relate it. Um, so 
one underlying theme from all uh, the presentations in the panel here are, you know, the challenges that Cuban agriculture faces. Most of us really concentrated on non-sugar agriculture, although usufructo also extends to uh, sugarcane. But I think that in the last paper, Joan uh, really hammered the whole issue of property rights and the whole issue of the role of the market uh, the, the way that it's framed in the Cuban, um, you know, recent usufruct legislation and more recent in the constitution is exactly what he mentioned in his paper, which is that the market-based mechanisms are designed, the expectation in Cuba is that they're designed to play a complementary role to the to central plan. So in essence, you know, we don't see a, a movement one way or another saying, well, you know, we're going to eradicate central planning and replace it with strictly market oriented. Now, Juan Tomas mentioned something that also ties into this, um, which was about the fact that subsidies, you, you know, you could have a, a market, a competitive uh, based agriculture or capitalist based agriculture, but it's heavily subsidized too. And he alluded to the European Union and to, and to the US as finding that that balance. But there's a lot of debate here in American agriculture as well as to what is the function, how far can the state go in terms of federal subsidies and agricultural you know, acreage programs and things like that. So, so I think that you, Larry, you put up really an underlying theme of all these papers, but it's, it's a puzzle much more pronounced for Cuba because of the, the weight, for example, um, I was listening to Joan's presentation uh, about uh, Decreto de Ley 358, Decree Law 358. And at, towards the end, he's talking about, uh, and he ran out of time, but he was going to talk about the, uh, the conditions to terminate the use of fruit, you know. And there you have conditions that tell you, hey, you know, if you violate, you know, we reserve the right to, to terminate the use of fruit. And so I, I think this is the, this, the big puzzle that we've been trying to figure out for years and years, mostly since 1989, when it became obvious that uh, Cuba uh, was um, allowing some, you know, less centralized um, mechanisms in agriculture. But uh, I would say that um, the way that it's framed, if you look at it from the context of the farmers uh, and the use of fruit, and I, I keep harping on that because that's where we find uh, very detailed decreed laws, it tells you exactly that, that, you know, they are at the mercy of the state, basically, you know, so I'll leave it at that. I, I hope my colleagues have other comments regarding your very excellent question. <laughs> Thank you. If I could make a, a, a quick observation, um, in the 1990s, when they were breaking up the state farms into DUBPCs, one thing that we found is we had the opportunity to get out in the field and talk with the UBPC members. They didn't have title to the land, but they very much felt like it was their land. And I think that was a function of the fact that they had gone from being one of 250 people working on, on an immense state farm to be in one of maybe 30 or 40 people working a much smaller piece of ground. And, and so, yeah, they didn't have title, but they very much felt a sense of ownership um, um, and, and a desire to make the land as productive as they could um, uh, and, and, and maintain the land and the associated assets that might've come along with it. Um, Quite surprisingly, in my view, the UBPC experiment was not particularly successful, not nearly as successful in terms of yields and productivity as the, the CCSs and the CPAs, which had been in place even before the, the UBPCs were created. Um, so there's a, there's a distinct difference there. Um, I, and I, I, another interesting, I guess it was probably 95, 96, we had a chance to go out on a farm and um, this is an example of the level of state control. Um, they were producing uh, root crops on a really poorly drained uh, area and um, bananas up on some higher, drier ground. And we said, why are you producing the root crops on wet, 
poorly drained soil. And they threw up their hands and they said, because the central planters say we have to plant root crops there. There have been root crops planted there for 50 years and you're gonna to continue to plant root crops there. They said, we offered, we'll take the same number of hectares and move the root crops to better soil and move and replace it with bananas. So our acreage of the two crops doesn't change, but the state, state planters wouldn't let us do that. I haven't had a chance to get out in the field now for a number of years. I would hope that that level of control has, has waned, if not been eliminated altogether. Um, but still, the, the, the requirements the government has trying to provide through food through the Ecopio um, present some real constraints in what the, what the government can afford to pay the farmers. Um, it's, a, it's a system, as long as the Ecopio is in place, I understand it's re the reason and the rationale for it, but um, boy, that sure distorts the markets in, in extraordinary ways. Right, right. And then it shows you that, that, that impasse there. I mean, that was, that was probably the best illustration I've heard of, of the central problem. And, and ultimately something's got to give. <clears throat> From a lot of people's perspective, it's going back to traditional uh, market-based farming. Uh, there may be other solutions, but right now, all that, that we hear and, and in these um, four excellent papers, all that we hear are variations of moving around within this, this kind of structural institutionalized disaster um, with absolutely no ability to move outside of those boundaries. And that's what makes this particularly interesting. Um, but I've got some more questions for you folks. Here's a question for Mario from uh, Natalia Delgado. Mario, why do you lump together private ownership uh, with other forms of use in the non-state sector? Uh, are all of these components of the non-state sector um, have substantially equal characteristics or are they different? Well, thank, thank you, uh, Natalia. Excellent question. I think she's referring, she was referring to when I presented the data tables and I had CCS and private or in, in Spanish, CCS y privados. So unfortunately, that's the way that the Cuban government uh, National Statistics Office uh, bundles that data. So it's using the, the even, even using the quarterly reports on uh, agricultural production, non-sugar production, for example, or indicadores del sector agropecuario, um, it's impossible to dissect, you know, what portion of total output comes from the private versus the private farmers versus the CCSs. Um, it would be great if we had that uh, separate information. Um, even, by the way, even the number of farmers, even if there, there's, um, uh, Earlier this year, um, I co-authored a paper with uh, Carmelo, Carmelo Mesalago, and we wrote about usufruct farming. And we, we really had to do a lot of forensic accounting, so to speak, <laughs> uh, to, to really estimate the number of usufruct farmers at a different point in time. And some people came back to us and were asking us, what, how come you don't have a data series that, that's really comprehensive? And it's there's some contradictions on your data series. So we ended up really explaining why the contradictions were, you know, what was the reason for those accounting or statistical contradictions. So that's really the reason why we aggregate all those two together. But but let me finish quickly. The other part of our question is very good also um, that, and, and let me try to answer that, which I can at least uh, in a qualitative basis, they, they don't have the same characteristics. You know, the private, and I have my own family members that are agricultores pequeños, and they're very different in outlook, and that relates to property form and ownership than people who belong to us, to, you know, associates who belong to a CCS. Um, so so there, there are differences between them, but statistically, officially, they're uh, bundled together, okay? I hope I was able to answer the question. No, no, you were. So here's a question. You're going to all put on your uh, your uh, predictors hats. Uh, it's from uh, Roger de la Torre Casanova. And here's a question. Will Cuba be able to fulfill its sugar contract with China of 400,000 tons? And if you have the answer, uh, we can take odds and bets after the, um, after the, the panel is concluded. Yes, uh, maybe I can answer. 
Larry? Please, please. Yes, yes. You know, uh, Cuba is producing over a million sugar tons a year. So the quota uh, committed to China is, is safe. You know, it's, uh, it's there for, for many years. We don't know for how long and we don't know at uh, which conditions because it's all secret. But uh, yes, no, no problem in, in meeting that. Uh, I guess the problems in, in food production are so serious that they're never contemplating in the last few years and much less in the short term now, uh, increased production in sugar. Uh, whatever resources they have, uh, they have to dedicate to, to the food stuff, uh, which, which is a problem. You know, there are farmers there that can do one, two, or three crops a year and rotate the, the, the crop, but the supplies have to be there on a, on a timely basis. You know, when you have a short window for three crops of uh, whatever it is, potato, tomato, uh, the window is, is very narrow and all your supplies need to be there. This is why I think the first inning has to be in, in bringing in the, the, the supplies to, to everyone, you know, everyone that is producing, you know, make sure that, that, that they have the supplies uh, that they need because it's a lot easier to find a tire, a battery, or to fix a broken hose uh, than to find the right type of seeds. Right. Yeah, they general, uh, generally they think that, uh, they say that Cuba requires about 700,000 tons of sugar, more or less, uh, to meet domestic demand. Uh, and they've got the 400,000 ton commitment. So as long as they're about 1.1 million tons, uh, they should be able to meet that, the Chinese commitment without too much trouble. Okay. I, I, would say, I would say about that, you know, that, that's right. That, that's a number for domestic consumption. But bear in mind that 700,000 uh, tons, it's very small amount of domestic consumption. Uh, per capita, right? So, so it assumes that domestic consumption will remain fixed. It, it's just the same thing that we haven't really spoken about here. And I don't know if you have a question coming up, but I'll throw it out there. Price controls. I mean, by decree, the government says, you know, the price of Malanga will be so much, the price of yuca, the price of this, the price of that. So I, I, I think if you look at the question and I, I, I was just thinking out loud and I think Bill, you, you had a, a table that had 8.4, million metric tons of output of sugar back in 89. Yeah, I don't want to tell you how old I was in 89, but much younger than today. Like, but, and then if you see the rate of decline over, <laughs> over those 32 years, right, the rate of decline, uh, it's plausible to, for Cuba to say, you know, we won't be able to fulfill the sugar quota. I know right now they have the output because we, we assume that consumption remains fixed, but it, it's, every time I, I look at agriculture, I, I, I look at you know, framing, you know, framing prices, framing output, framing property, framing production. And uh, it's, it's a big topic in, in agriculture, I think. And I don't know if anybody will come to us with questions about prices. Uh, no, uh, one more thing on, on the local consumption of sugar. Every time there's more sugar for local construct cons uh, consumption being diverted to the dollar market, to the Diplo Tiendas. Every time they're leaving less for the uh, for the libreta, so when you go and you buy sugar in Cuba uh, with uh, convertible currency, you're probably paying you know what we pay the astronomical amount that that, that we pay. There was a year I'm going to say it was about ten years ago where Cuba actually had to import sugar. Um, to meet the domestic supply. It wasn't a large volume, uh, but they, they met their export commitment to China and had to import a little bit of sugar, which was a stunning development given the, the well, long history. I, I, From I, France I, and Colombia. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't see it as stunning because uh, the, ma the problem is that in, in November, December, you have exhausted your inventory and you may have to buy a little bit from uh, from the outside to make it to uh, to the beginning of the year where your own production uh, uh, p p p picks up. It, it, it happens, you know, all over the, the sugar market. As you get to the end of a harvest year, 
you see that the prices start climbing. You know, if, if you do the, the 12 months chart and the USDA and you do it year after year after year, you could see that when the end of the Brazilian uh, harvest is, is ending, the, the prices are always uh, jumping. So I think Cuba had a mismanagement in, in that occasion of what was their inventory and how much they needed. And they had to buy a little bit in the, in the export market. I have a question from Silvia Pedraza. De mi comentario para Juan Tomás Sánchez, but it can go to all of you folks. Con respeto a la nueva tarea de reordenamiento del gobierno, un amigo de Cuba me dijo con típico humor que en la isla dicen que lo que quiere decir es tú ordenas y yo miento. Uh, yes, you know, it's, it's Marxism, Leninism, it's bureaucracy. And uh, it's a bad condiment for, for a food product. All right, which, which dovetails nicely on Jose Gavilando's questions also about that tarea ordenamiento. And the question is whether you think, given the tu ordena y yo miento um, <laughs> principle, uh, whether the uh, tarea ordenamiento reflects greater acceptance of market mechanisms in agriculture or other sectors and whether you think that the state will be effective in enforcing retail price controls on food and agriculture. That's for all of you. The, the no, price. Let, 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 yeah. let me jump first because I, I speak shorter than Mario. <laughs> <laughs> in both English and in Spanish. <laughs> uh, no, uh, la tarea ordenamiento is, is misdirected in the emergency in Cuba that is coming in the next few months that is still there. It's, it's a misguided effort. The, the effort, in my own opinion, has to be in supplies. You have to bring supplies. You have to sacrifice something else somewhere in the economy to bring in supplies on a timely uh, basis. Agriculture cannot wait. And if you read the recent reports by Pedro Monreal, and th there's a low yield in all of the agricultural products in, in the second half of 2019 and it's forecasted to, to be now. So I think the, it's not the ordenamiento that is the emergency. Emergency is bringing supplies for everybody that is in the business. There's always waste, there's always, you know, it's going to be like that forever and ever. Thank you, Mari. Uh, I was going to say, <laughs> that was very quick. I, I see, see if I can do better. Um, I think that one way to answer that very good question, by the way, by Jose Gabilondo. I, um, thank you, by the way, Jose, for your question. Um, I think one way to really answer that is to, to, to go back and look at what does the Tarea de Ordenamiento say about price controls and what does it say about the role of um, private, non-state, non not private, non-state production and how non-state production will still remain subordinated to cooperatives and cooperatives are a socialist form of production. Some, some may be better, some may, more, may be more efficient. You know, CP, we, we, I myself have said it here many times in all our agricultural panels, you know, the CCSs are more effective in, if you look at yields, whenever you can find data, but they are a socialized form of production. And then the usufruct farmers are being uh, compelled, okay, to associate themselves with these cooperatives. They cannot operate independent of these cooperatives, right? And that's in the most recent decree law, which goes, which, you know, builds right into the tarea de uh, reordenamiento. So it, from what I gather, it seems that central planning will remain or, it's the, the dominant form of um, economic coordination. Just a quick observation here. About six years ago, it was after the lineamientos, uh, we were down in Cuba, we had the opportunity, we were sitting around on someone's front porch one evening sipping rum. Um, and you, the more rum is consumed, a lot of times you get some very interesting observations from the uh, uh, people that you're sitting with. And one of them was a, a Ministry of Agriculture, fairly high staff person. 
And uh, he shrugged and he said, we've been telling people what to produce and how to produce it for 35 years. He said, it's a tough habit to break. And I thought that really got down to kind of the crux of the issue and in, in, in a lot of the prob uh, problems and challenges that they're facing in uh, terms of adjusting their policies. Right. Can um, I ask a question to uh, Professor Messina? Um, what kind of rum? Havana or mulata? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever okay. we could get our hands on. <laughs> very good, very good. All right. but we, we have a follow-up uh, from Jose Gavilando, and this is directed to Bill, but actually to all of you as well. And it goes to the, the issue of um, markets, but this time uh, markets within uh, government for, uh, for control. And then the question is, uh, does Alimport coordinate all food imports by Cuba, or is there any internal competition within the Cuban state for the authority or jurisdiction over imports? I am not hugely well informed on that topic. I am not aware of there being any internal uh, um, fighting uh, over uh, what they import or how they import it, very much centrally planned. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't think there are competing interests coming, coming together trying to figure out how much wheat to import. Uh, rice would probably be a particularly interesting example since that's such a critically important component of the Cuban diet. Uh, but I don't, I don't really know the answer to that question, I'm afraid. Okay, so Anybody I'll, else? Import, I'll import may remain king of all bureaucracy with respect to this area? As far as I know, I mean, Al Import, uh, certainly, uh, when, I, when I talk about Al Import, I speak more in terms of the pivotal role that they play in terms of US imports. There's no other. Uh, interesting, several years ago, legislation was passed that, al at US, uh, that allowed USDA to um, grant funds for market promotion in Cuba. There's a couple different programs they have for US farm, farmers and farm cooperatives and industry associations to get USDA funding to promote their products uh, overseas. Um, in my, to my knowledge, there's only be one relatively recent um, request for those kinds of funds because it's not like you know, you could promote it to chefs. You could promote long grain, high quality U.S. rice to chefs within Cuba, but the chefs don't have any real influence over what's purchased or who purchases purchases it or when they purchase it. So, uh, the, the the use of market promotion funds in Cuba, even though it's allowed now, um, is very much constrained by the structure and function of the of the purchasing process and the centralization from mail import. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, a question from Luis Luis to all of you. Um, isn't export agriculture easier to implement than import substitution? Uh, for exports incentives come in the form of market prices. Import substitution on the contrary engenders subsidies and controls. Cuba exports lemons and pineapples and imports wheat and barley, for example. That's right, uh, yeah, definitely, you know, export, um, of our goal. I mean, uh, Juan Tomas has a historical um, memory, but and, and he's got many works in ASCII in the past where he's documented the the system uh, of export, right? And we we a couple of years back we presented a paper together where we documented um, how certain products back in the fifties were exported. You know, we documented the mechanism sort of from from production in Cuba all the way to the Pompano Beach uh, market here uh, in the US. And it, it wasn't perfect, right? If my recollection doesn't fail me, he's here, he can, <laughs> it's a good thing to have a co-author present so he can correct you or bail you out, so to speak. But, um, but, but it worked, right? To some degree, it worked. Cuba was able to export. So Luis is, is right about that question, you know, and that's exactly the gist of my paper with Armando. If you read the uh, the El Plan de Alimentario y de Nutrición y todas esas cosas, it, it is an import substitution plan. I mean, the, 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 the most central component is component number three, which basically openly says, you know, we're planning to import substitution or to substitute imports, but it's been tried before. And this is where we go around in circles in agriculture, right? And uh, and so so I... Thank you, Luis, for the question. And 
I see Juan Tomas. Yeah, wants to... let, let me uh, let me expand a little bit. The, the it's it's easier to export um, something that is done in your backyard on a, or in a very small plot of land. It's easier to export papaya, and there are things that are being exported on a uh, on a very limited scale. Uh, but really, the ones that really need, especially rice, rice is, uh, you cannot be competitive by planting rice in less than, uh, than 20 to 30 caballerias. You know, you have to bring in combines uh, to, 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 to be efficient. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to substitute the, the, the rice imports and the and the, the, the other, the corn is, is very hard. It's, it's a very major investment to, 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 to help those, uh, those imports. All right. Now here's, here's an, uh, an interesting question. And it's actually uh, one thing that was kind of at the margins of your discussion, but, but really it's a great idea to, to kind of center it. Uh, and it's from uh, David Dysert. Um, who'd been traveling to Cuba for the last eight years and had noticed that Havana has more rural, rural organic gardens within the city limits um, over the course of the year. So we're looking at not traditional agriculture, but we're now looking at urban agriculture, the kinds of things that kind of slip between, especially this is for John, the legal cracks, right? This is urban gardening. And, and he in fact has been teaching many Cubans how to grow their own vegetables along with raising rabbits as a source of protein. Um, and he suggests that uh, the, the solution to the problem of how one eats an elephant is uh, one bite at a time. And this may be a good way of teaching uh, the, the Cuban people uh, self-sufficiency beyond or outside of the uh, structural or institutionalized uh, mechanisms and the locations, the traditional locations of agricultural production that, that we've been talking about. And so I leave you with that comment and also then with a question uh, implicit in it, to what extent or how useful or what value is there to um, either fostering, recognizing, expanding, or dealing with uh, the issue of urban farming, uh, especially organic farming, and to what extent is the state interested? Well, the state is very interested in, in promoting the organoponicos, the, the urban gardens, um, and they are a very important component of the, the, the food supply in their, in their neighborhoods there. Plus, I would argue that if, if, if you could find statistics, I bet that's some of the most productive land in Cuba. Um, when you go by those uh, uh, urban gardens, they look pretty good. Um, so the state is trying to promote that. Um, and, and opening more, I think, more of the urban gardens uh, pretty much all the time. Again, it's been several years now since I've been to Cuba, um, but it seemed like for a while there, every time you went, there was a, another patch of ground that had, in an urban area that had been uh, uh, made into a very small um, uh, urban garden. So it's a, it's a component and they're trying, to, they're trying to promote it as best they yes, can. Yes, it, it, uh, I'll, I'll find it and, and share it. Uh, recently, Pedro Monreal on El Estado Como Tal, uh, he has that statistic uh, in there, and it was very substantial what is produced in the traspatios of, uh, of, of, of homes and small farmers. And, uh, you know, there are farmers there that are, have contracts with, uh, with the state to produce eggs or to produce uh, something and and they that helps being able to produce other things that they can sell on on their own there is a, there's a lot of that there's a lot of um captive farmers let's call it one way so, well, so it's a good good um question i, I think urban agriculture you know th there is literature on Cuba dating back to, I think, 1997, when they began the Programa Nacional de Agricultura Urbana and all those wonderful things. But the, the, most of the resources have been centered really in Havana. That's where people come in and you can see in, in Alamar and places like that, you can see the organoponicos. For 
localized consumption, right? So it, it, it's a complementary way of having localized consumption. We have near where I teach at Columbia University, um, we have a, an urban farm where, which is managed by a community board number 2017 or something in New York. And they do, they, they, they sell, they, they sell in the, in the market, in the Union Square market on, on the weekends. This is before the pandemic, of course. But my point being that it's part of the overall menu of agricultural output in an economy, but it will not, in my opinion, at least, I don't think it will resolve the issues that Cuba is facing because we're talking about a very a population of 11.2, 11.2 something million people and a migration of labor and essential input away from uh, agriculture. That's a major problem that agriculture faces on top of price controls and property issues or you know insufficient autonomy and all that. You have a migration of labor going away. So most, when I travel to Cuba, most of the people that I see working in urban farming are, how can I say this? Are mostly like senior citizens. I mean, you know, you, you see older people working in farming, not just in urban farming, but in most aspects of farming. So it, it's uh, it's part of the menu, I think, but very far from being, you know, uh, a, a scalable solution for a country the size of Cuba. And, and also, by the way, with the levels of urbanization that Cuba has. And one final comment, the connected to urban farming, the condition of the housing stock in Cuba. So people are going to say, you know, we need to resolve the housing problem, the food problem before I can join into organic farming and all that. So, but the, the state has devoted resources to organic farming. You know, they have programs and centers that promote it and so on. Last question, um, because our time is, is, is up, but I'm going to um, cheat a little and, and take us just slightly over. But it, it kind of uh, it, it carries out. This is from uh, Sergio with the SBKs, but it builds on your last comment, Mario, which is if you're going to be building in a deteriorating city, uh, a city where uh, you've got a bunch of lead paint uh, and other things now in the ground that you're using to cultivate, to, to make lettuce and the like, the question is, uh, environmental issues, the under, uh, environmental issues underlying the problems facing Cuban agriculture um, in the organoponicos, of course, but in large scale, of course, in, in standard agriculture. Uh, this is an issue that was raised by Funes Monsote since the 19th century. While some deterioration could be reversed by investing in the recovery of the land, are there estimates of how many resources would be required and how to access them? Uh, to meet the issues potential and to be discovered and, and actually known uh, that touch on environmental issues. Yeah, look, the, the, some, of, some of my colleagues here will, will uh, you know, are familiar with this. Um, I, I think the soil quality has, in, in many parts of the island has been really, really been depleted. Um, I think that also, the, the, there's a going back and forth, right? Because th there was a so-called intensive agricultural model of production all the way until the early 1990s. And then Cuba theoretically migrated or transitioned to a less um, input intensive model of agricultural production during the special period and in recent years and all that. But the magnitude of the environmental problem is pretty complex because remember you have multiple forms of production in the economy and accounting, it's, it's iffy about it. Um, the other thing is the where you see traction animals being used, people say, well, that's environmentally friendly and so on. And then you have another plot that's using tractors from the Soviet Union, uh, from the former Soviet Union contaminating the environment. So there's a, that level of pollution and all that. I, I, and, and so it goes back to something that John uh, mentioned in his paper, which are incentives, right? So what are the incentives? You know, if you are a private, a, a, a pequeño agricultor and you, you have, you're facing all these restrictions to, to produce your output, you're facing input restrictions, you're facing price controls, you're facing a copy, you're facing so many limitations. I really think that, you know, you have to consider the environmental impact, but that takes us a backseat really. Uh, and I'm not saying that the, by the way, before I stop, I'm not saying that this agricultores pequeño are contaminating the land and all that, but, but when people are facing production constraints, that's, that's what happens. 
you know, you, you, you need to produce with whatever you can find. You don't have the luxury of saying, I'm going to be environmentally, you know, conscious to the degree of people in other places can be. Okay. Just a, a quick observation. Uh, we've been trying to launch a program, uh, a project with the uh, um, Soils Institute in Cuba. Uh, uh, we have, we're very fortunate, you have to have uh, really the most distinguished tropical soil specialist in the world, a gentleman who, by the name of Pedro Sanchez, who happens to be Cuban American. And uh, uh, he's been to Cuba a number of times with us. And when he looks at the soils, even in areas where it's degraded, he does not feel as though uh, uh, they're beyond being able to re be recuperated with, with proper treatment and that sort of thing. But in terms of details on what would be needed, there's testing that needs to be done. And, and the soils ministry is eager to work with us and we're eager to work with them. But because of the antagonistic approach of the uh, current administration, uh, it, it hasn't been possible for us to get approval to do that yet, but that's on the docket and hopefully we're gonna be able to get that launched uh, fairly soon here to provide some more detail. Uh, but, um, you know, you just, if, if you take soil ladder production, the interesting thing, Matabu fixes nitrogen, which means um, uh, it helps reestablish the nutritive capacity of the soils. Um, so it's one upside to it. And the other one being the fact that they can make some pretty good charcoal out of it. So it's not all uh, 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 downside when you talk about modern but uh, uh, the tremendous productive potential in Cuba that's definitely recoverable in our estimation. And with that, I will close the session. Thank you all very, very much for a, a fascinating set of presentations and an even more fascinating discussion that followed. Thank you audience for your questions and your patience with us. We went a little over, uh, really appreciate it. Great job. And I look forward to the rest of the panels and the conferences uh, tomorrow. Thank you. And Thank you, Larry. we're done. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.